Welcome to Murder Mile, a true crime podcast, an audio guided walk of London's most notorious and often forgotten murder cases, all set within one square mile of the West End. Today's episode is a guided walk of one of Britain's deadliest mass murders. It's a crime so horrific, it's shocking that the perpetrator himself isn't uttered in the same breath as Shipman, Brady or the Wests. And yet, almost 40 years on, the culprit, the victims and even the story itself is almost entirely forgotten. Murder Mile contains vivid descriptions, which may not be suitable for those of a sensitive disposition, as well as photos, videos and maps, which accompany this series, so that, no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 1 the Denmark Place Fire. Today, I'm standing on Denmark Street, WC2, a stumpy little thoroughfare nestling in the borough of St Giles, in the beating heart of London's bustling West End. Just a stone's throw away from Tottenham Court Road to the north, Covent Garden to the south, and Theatreland and Soho to the west. Looking tatty and a little unloved, Denmark Street consists of a mishmash of three and four storey buildings, cobbled together over four centuries, and yet almost all feature a wealth of music shops on the ground floor, with office space and apartments above. Some of the buildings are listed, others are not, and a few have even been abandoned, leaving behind an empty shell full of rats, turds, dust, debris and distant memories. At just 270 feet long and 30 feet wide, Denmark Street is a type of street you could easily miss in a sprawling metropolis like London, situated as it is at the arse end of the A40. With the Grade 1 listed splendour of St Giles and the Fields Church at one end, a simple set of traffic lights to Charing Cross Road at the other, under the looming menace of the centre point skyscraper, and surrounded by the dull drone of demolition as the bulldozers and diggers of Crossrail level great swathes of the city. Before this street, and its seedy little sister, Denmark Place, became synonymous with murder, Denmark Street was once a mecca for aspiring musicians, such as the Kinks, the Who, the Rolling Stones, Small Faces and Jimi Hendrix, all who either lived, wrote or recorded here. The Sex Pistols lived above number six. Elton John wrote in Regent Sounds Records at number four. And a young David Bowie slept in his camper van by night, as by day he soaked up the ambiance of London's rock and roll utopia. What Carnaby Street was to the London fashion scene of the 60s and 70s, Denmark Street was to music. But by 1980, with the streets strewn with litter, Squatters having moved in, and much of its sparkle gone, Denmark Street would become infamous for something unsavoury. A murder. A mass murder. So cruel, so callous, and so deadly, it's shocking that such a heinous crime is barely known. The story of one of London's deadliest mass murders has been reduced to a whisper. Its memory almost entirely forgotten, and the last hint that this street holds a dark history is about to be erased forever. In late 1970s London, Cuban popular dance music known as salsa was a little known part of the underground music scene in Soho's clubland made popular by South and Central American immigrants who came to the city on a one to three year visa as part of the Department of Employment's recruitment program to fill British hotels with service staff on a minimum wage. One such man was Hernan Vargas, a 26 year old Colombian 
who by day slogged his guts out in a menial job just to make ends meet. But by night, he lived for the music. He lived to dance, and he lived to salsa. Nicknamed El Flaco, which means skinny, Hernan Vargas was the resident DJ at El Condita, alias The Hiding Place, an illegally run nightclub which was hidden from view in a disused attic on Hanway Street, an unlit, seedy little side street between Oxford Street and Tottencourt Road, until they were shut down by the police. And then promptly, they reopened just one street away at 18 Denmark Place and was renamed El Huerco, which aptly translates as The Hole. 18 Denmark Place, a former 19th century three-storey coach house and home of El Huerco, was owned by Victor Gonzalez, a shady businessman from Spain with a passion for gambling but a greater thirst for profit, who, like many of London's illegal club owners, bolstered his illicit income by a fleet of hardly hygienic hot dog carts. It was operated under the radar of the police, the fire brigade and the local council, flouting licensing laws and was devoid of fire alarms, sprinklers, extinguishers and a fully working fire escape. But the dangers aside, for many El Huerco was a safe haven, a release a chance to drink, chat, and dance. And regardless of whether you were Colombian, Spanish, Jamaican, Irish, or English, a waiter, a painter, a dishwasher, or a hot dog vendor, here you could be whoever you wanted to be. This was a private club for a very select group, and with no sign on the walls, and no bouncers on the door, if you wanted in, you rang the bell, you waited, and if your face, name, and membership number fitted the bill, the key was tossed down, the door was opened, and you were in. The night of Saturday the 16th of August 1980 was no exception, as after another tedious game of cat and mouse between the council and Victor Gonzalez, Lubin Rees was informed that, once again, his club night would be shut down by the police on Monday morning. And so blessed with two days' grace, El Huerco would host a farewell party. With the rule book thrown out of the window, the drinks flowed and the clubbers grooved as Hernan Skinny Vargas spun hot salsa tunes from his decks. But safety was the last thing on anyone's mind, as this was going to be a night to remember. By 2 a.m., After a long hot summer where the temperatures had soared into the low 30s, over 150 drinkers, dancers and gamblers had crammed into the first and second floor of 18 Denmark Place. The air was thick with smoke. The walls were soaked with sweat. And even the drinks were warm to the touch. Unfortunately, one man's temperature was getting a little too hot. John Thompson, a 42-year-old resident of Morning Lane in Hackney, was a semi-regular guest at the gambling club, with prior convictions for drug dealing, arson and petty theft. Thompson went by the nicknames of the Gypsy, having been born into a travelling community in Scotland, and Punch, owing to his fiery temper, drunken rages and being a little too handy with his fists. By 3am, Thompson had drank himself into a drunken stupor, yet again having blown a sizable chunk of money playing poker and ploughing coins into the slot machine. And now, he was looking for someone to blame. As per usual, Jose Franco, the manager of the venue, bore the brunt of Thompson's abuse, receiving both barrels in the form of fists, fury and racial slurs. And therefore, rightly, Thompson was forcibly ejected from the premises, thrown out into the dingy darkness of Denmark Place, 
as the fiery Scotsman's temper was taken out on every wall, door and dustbin, until finally he was gone. And so, with a cheer, a giggle and a round of applause, the farewell party continued. But 20 minutes later, Thompson returned and he wanted revenge. Having taken a return trip to the nearest service station in Camden, Thompson staggered out of a black cab on St Giles High Street and into the claustrophobic darkness of Denmark Place and drunkenly stumbled the final 200 feet to number 18. Thompson was witnessed moments later crouching down in the doorway but with no working street lamps, no neon signs, and no lights on. This clandestine little cut through, so cramped that even the moonlight couldn't illuminate it, was the perfect spot for a murder. Dismissed as just another drunk, the witness failed to see the rage on Thompson's face, failed to hear the anger in his voice, and failed to spot the ominous bulge in his jacket. As above him, the music pumped, making his blood boil. Inside, the party was in full swing. The night was hot, the air was thick, and to keep the party secret, the windows were shut. But Jose Franco kept the cool drinks flowing. Hernan Skinny Vargas kept the south track spinning with a special mix from his own personal collection and Eduardo Trajillo toasted the last days of his best friend, Elizabeth Mercado, having booked her airline ticket to take her back home to Colombia. Outside, having blocked the only entrance or exit to both clubs, Thompson opened his jacket, pulled out a black metal can, and poured through the letterbox two gallons of petrol. Inside the club, no one noticed the temperature rise. No one heard the crackle of fire as the flames licked up the wooden walls. And no one smelt the choking smoke above the thick aroma of tobacco and sweaty bodies. At a little after 3.30 a.m., Lubin Rees heard a bang. Not a big bang but just enough of a bang to be heard over the music, and asked, did you hear that? But no one was sure, so we went outside to check. What greeted him was an inferno. The entire central stairwell was engulfed in flames as fire licked up the tinder-dry walls, making the security doors too hot to touch, let alone open. Another bang shook the stairwell, then another, and another, as the ground floor erupted with a series of explosions, as having converted the concrete floored space into a parking bay, it now housed almost 30 hot dog vendors trolleys, each packing two 13 kilo bottles of highly flammable propane. Seeing the flames fill the ground floor, and quickly enveloped the further two floors, John Thompson fled. Not to call the fire brigade, not to call for an ambulance, not to call for any help at all, but to run. To run from the fiery hell that he had created out of anger and petty spite, leaving over 150 innocent people trapped inside a burning building, their screams still ringing in his ears, as many were burnt alive. The Soho Fire Brigade, based at 126 Shaftesbury Avenue, were alerted to the blaze just a few minutes later. Six fire engines screamed down Charing Cross Road, and turning right into Denmark Street, they were confronted by a scene which shocked even seasoned professionals. At first, with the street being so ominously quiet, the Fire Brigade thought that they'd come to the wrong address. And they had. They also thought that maybe this was a hoax. 
But at number 21 Denmark Street, the building which 18 Denmark Place immediately backed onto, they could see smoke seeping through the shuttered windows. And beyond that, they could hear screaming. When David Parr, the firefighter from Soho Brigade's Green Watch, approached the ground floor at 21 Denmark Street, formerly home to Rhodes Music Store, he was greeted by a sight which has haunted him forever. As trapped inside the store was a frantic man, wielding an electric guitar like it was an axe, desperately trying to smash through the security grill on the window to escape. It took the firefighters four minutes to break through the double thickness, triple bolted, steel lined security door of the front of Rhodes Music Store. But they were too late, as having escaped the horrifying inferno in El Hueco, the desperate man died of asphyxiation, just a few feet from safety. But it wasn't until the Soho Fire Brigade arrived at Denmark Place, the alley at the rear, that they saw the full horror of the scene. Divisional Fire Officer Roy Baldwin later stated, As we arrived on Denmark Place, the whole building was ablaze. People were ripping shutters off the windows. They were smashing glass with their bare hands. People were throwing themselves from the second and third floor out into the street below, their clothes still on fire, smashing their bones. With the alley being barely 10 feet wide and blocked by bollards, none of the six fire engines could enter Denmark Place so the firefighters had to tackle the blaze by hand, aiming heavy hoses at the inferno as bodies rained down and a humid wind whipped up the alley, fanning the flames even further. With solid walls made from oak timbers, the floors of thick wooden beams and every side lined with plasterboard, even the wrought iron fire escape was covered in plywood. It took almost three hours to extinguish the fire, and a further six before the building was even safe to enter, as the fire consumed a lethal mix of petrol, alcohol and propane. Inside, everything was black and dark and wet. The air was thick with black acrid smoke. The smell of petrol stung your nostrils, and hot melted plastic dripped from the ceiling. The ferocity of the fire was so intense that it bent floors and buckled doors. But the true horror of the inferno was yet to greet the firefighters, as they approached the bar where over 150 terrified patrons had panicked, unable to escape the flames of El Juerco. The layout of the bar was described in court as a death trap, lethal. The room was long and narrow, tightly packed with long wooden benches, with just a single entrance or exit at one end of the bar, which, when crammed full of sweaty bodies, to the point where you could hardly breathe, let alone move, under the best of circumstances, it was impossible to escape. And on that night, El Hueco's farewell party, it was unusually busy. Fire Officer Baldwin described the charred aftermath of the barroom. He said, I have never seen bodies packed together like that before. The fire must have spread too quickly. People were still sitting at tables. They were slumped at the bar. Many still had drinks in their hands. Of the survivors, people talked of screaming, of skin peeling off faces, of trying to get out, but finding the doors locked. Inside... Nobody stood a chance. Greenwatch's fire brigade photographer, Alan Freeman, described the horror as, it was as if the bodies were dominoes that had been pushed over. And as the panic enveloped the room, as the terrified punters rushed to escape, they were forced to climb over bodies three deep. Some died where they sat. Some died where they stood. And others died huddled together in the corner, as amongst the indecipherable charred blackness of the bar, the only evidence of life were skulls. 
It took four pathologists and three dentists two months to identify the bodies. Celebrating her final night in London, before her return flight to Colombia, Elizabeth Mercado and her friend Eduardo Trujillo escaped the blaze, suffering broken bones and second-degree burns as they leapt from a second-story window. They were just two of the 23 people who were confirmed as wounded and escaped with their lives. 37 people died in the Denmark Place fire. 14 women, 23 men, and one unborn baby. The rest of the party's revelers simply vanished into the night. Too traumatized by the horror to give witness testimony, too terrified by the blaze to seek medical help, and too scared of the repercussions by the authorities given their dubious immigration status. Those who died in the Denmark Place fire were Sylvia Aguirre, Alvaro Barrios, Pamela Boff, Bedarin Baratti, Archibaldo Donald Campbell, Leonard Carroll, Diana Coward, Clancy Dederin, Maria Dick, Peter Allen Dolan, Paul Fiorillo, Jose Franco, Carol Gorey, Maria Gumel, Teresa Gumel, Denise Hannigan, Christina Isherwood, Luis Mary Londono, Avril McDermott, Diana McLaverley, Gloria Munnes, Anita Murray, Antonio Navarro, Bridget Norton, Julian Ortegan Carcez, Seg Puteo, William Ramsey, Alexander Reed, Juan Antonio Sagasta Juldan, Edgar Smith, Carlos Alberto Soto, Robert Certain, Eustace Ralph Taylor Harding, Plutarco Alessandro Vargas Burnett, Hernan Vargas, Beatrice Vargas Corrales, and Frederick Yule. Of those who died, Hernan Skinny Vargas, the resident DJ at El Huerco, died trying to save his prized collection of vinyl records, which he'd stored in the attic. Jose Franco, the bar manager who had escorted John Thompson off the premises, died trying to escort people to safety. And one of the youngest victims, 17-year-old Alexander Reed, died having heroically re-entered the burning building to rescue a pregnant woman. Neither survived. Victor Gonzalez, the owner of 18 Denmark Place, and Lubin Rees, the club promoter for El Huerco, both survived the fire, and following a court case, neither men were charged. With the exception of the Times, the Observer, and the Glasgow Herald, very few newspapers followed the story, choosing instead to focus on the hunt for the Yorkshire Ripper. Whereas those who did wrongly assumed that it was either a dispute between drug dealers, a grudge match involving South American politics, or it was part of a gangland feud between two rival groups of hot dog vendors. Having been identified by the service station manager, and the black cab driver, John the Gypsy Thompson was arrested just two days later. He appeared at Bow Street Magistrates Court on the 29th of August 1980, where he pleaded not guilty to the charge of murder. At his trial, Thompson's defence was that he was drunk. And then he proceeded to blame Jose Franco, the deceased bar manager at El Huerco, for overcharging him for a drink. Thompson was found guilty and charged on the 7th of May 1981 with one charge of first-degree arson, one unrelated charge of second-degree arson, one charge of manslaughter, having mistakenly caused the death of his friend who was inside the club and died in the fire, 
and 36 counts of murder. But after the abolition of the death penalty, Thompson was given the harshest sentence that the British legal system could give him. Life imprisonment. That's 30 years. That's not even one year for each of his victims. The Denmark Place fire is widely regarded as one of the deadliest blazes in London since the Blitz of World War II. And yet, unlike the King's Cross fire, with 31 people dead, and the Great Fire of London, just six people dead, those who died at 18 Denmark Place have almost been forgotten. There is no plaque on the wall, no memorial above the door, and as of today, the building is now entirely demolished. John the Gypsy Thompson, the 42-year-old petty thief, convicted drug dealer, and now widely considered one of Britain's worst mass murderers, was eligible for parole on May 2011. But following a long battle with lung cancer, he died alone in a prison hospital on the 16th of August 2008. Coincidentally, on the 28th anniversary of the Denmark Place fire. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. If you enjoy